Hi, my name is Salma Hayek Pino, and I chime for justice. Hi, I'm Beyonce Knowles Carter, and I chime for health. We're all here because we want to change. What happens when we educate girls? We empower them. This is not a fringe issue. This is an issue that is basic to absolutely every issue on earth. that a tiny device like this could be a weapon. The click of a button, we can be connected around the world. You can spread messages that lead to revolutions. Uh -huh. powerful tool a woman can have is her own education. Help. Justice. Three things to change the world. My name is Katy Perry and I chime for justice. Justice. My name is Ben Affleck and I chime for health. Education. Education. I chime for my daughter. I chime for Malala. I chime for my mother. My grandmother. My mom. Alfarita Marley. My name is Julia Roberts and I chime for every woman. Let's listen very closely to the voices that have never been heard before. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. I'm sure you must be womened out by now. <laughs> so I'm sorry, because I'm going to talk about women again. But um, so this is the organization I work for, Time for Change. And as you see, it has a big part of, uh, that's the crowdfunding. And the other part, which is what I do, is storytelling. Um, Time for Change is a very powerful campaign for a simple reason, is that powerful partners have come together to try to help women. Uh, meaning uh, people, influential people like Beyonce, like Salma, like all these artists, but also social media like Facebook or Twitter, uh, the Bill Gates Foundation, and, and more. So obviously when you have a, so much power to, you know, coming together, the result is powerful. But my role is to uh, sort of um, uh, keep uh, the person, the ordinary people, uh, at the heart of the story. And the reason why I committed to women's issues, I've been a journalist for many years, but I've been working on this issue for maybe 15 years, less, a bit less. <laughs> and it all started actually uh, when I saw this picture. This is all those little babies here, uh, there's actually double that amount in real life, but all these little babies here have lost their father to the attack on the World Trade Center. So the, the mothers, the mothers uh, came together and this conversation you know, started sparkling. What do we do? What do we tell our kids? Uh, how do we find hope? Basically, that was the idea. How do we find hope? And, and, and one said, you know, we need to go in search of hope. And that stayed with me. And I felt like, well, you know, I had lived a similar situation than these women had. I knew exactly what they were going through. I knew they, what they were talking about. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna search for hope, but I'm not gonna do it in, um, it, I mean, I'm gonna define that hope, meaning I don't want, this is right after 9-11, right? So I don't want a religious hope. I don't want a spiritual hope. I'm gonna look for genuine human hope. 
So, um, so I did that, and my instinct told me to turn towards women, uh, to first have search for hope. Um, and that's, I had very little more than that. And also, um, I felt, well, you know, I know what men are thinking, I don't know what women are thinking. And that's when I realized that, you know, even when I went to school or everything, I never had an account of, of, of what women went through. Say, you know, when we, you taught the Second World War, there's no women there, as if they never existed, right? It's the same with every conflict. Women are victims, but who, who are they? What is their stories? Why, are we not let, why aren't we let them speak? Why don't we let them speak? Why, what's happening? What's the story? So this book, um, uh, I, went for, uh, I went to 18 countries, profile 18 women, uh, who my criteria for them was also that they would have stood alone at some point, meaning that whatever they did, at some point, no one was there to tell them it was the right thing to do, no one was there to encourage them, they just did it. So I introduced two people, for me, who exemplify very much what it means and the potential of giving a voice to women and to the voiceless in general. So my first, uh, so the book goes from, uh, goes from a cleaning lady in Morocco, or well, actually a Moroccan cleaning lady in France, and to a president who's a Johnson, um, Ellen Johnson Sully from Liberia. But I'm going to tell you about my cleaning lady, because she's my favorite. And um, so she actually is not uh, anymore a cleaning lady. These pictures I'm going to show you has been taken three weeks away in Cannes. That's also her in Cannes, uh, posing with her, you know, the actress that played her role, and the director. <laughs> <laughs> and because she speaks so much, the director is having a nap. And, uh, and that's her, she's talking. So the true story of that woman, so the film, uh, so she did a book, even though she was illiterate, I'll explain, uh, and this book was just adapted for, uh, and was just presented in Cannes, and won great awards. But this lady, Fatima, she grew up in Morocco and, um, and only went to school for three years. After three years, she was taken out of school, you have to work. Then she was married off to a man who took her to France and uh, had two little girls with her and then abandoned her. So here's Fatima in Paris, two girls to raise, no skills, uh, illiterate. And, and that's it, she starts working. She starts, and what can she do? Clean the pe people's homes. But this girl, when she was little, and, and she remembered when she went to school, uh, she remembered like her, the love she had for literature, right? And she didn't read herself much, but the teacher would read her Victor Hugo, and that was her favorite writer, and, and she had this thing in her. Obviously, none of that you know, could emerge in the life that was designed for her. So, so she, for 20 years, she, she was a cleaning lady. But what she did is that she, um, she started writing phonetically you know, on her kitchen table every night after coming back from work. And she wrote about what it's like to be a cleaning lady that nobody sees, nobody notices, she doesn't exist, she's interchangeable, even her kids don't look at her, and she writes about this, right? At some point she has an accident, and 20 years into it, and to that doctor, for the first time, she tells you know, her story and says, this is what happened to me, this is what I wanted to be, but I did write phonetically a little bit, you know, and the doctor looked at the material, transcribed it into French, and the rest is history, Fatima is up there. Um, but more importantly, you know, this is someone, this is what your typical person that didn't have a voice, that no one was really interested in her voice, and when she took it, really, um, because she went and herself found a publisher and all this, when she took it, it turns out that thousands and thousands and thousands of women all over Europe were living exactly the same situation. And for the first time, these women started speaking out, speaking with their own kids, speaking with their husbands. So all this, like, um, you know, super tense situation that was there uh, has been sort of relieved thanks to Fatima's courage. Um, I know exactly, I, I also grew up in Paris, so I know what she was up against, and I have the greatest admiration for, for, for someone like her. Um, and she's, oh, so she's very instrumental in me thinking, you know, I have to concentrate on women, but not only women, not women in general, not women as collective, not women as an ideal, but just women as, as, as like their potential for um, feeling justice in a way that is so raw and so pure that you can't stop them, basically, no? So the second person, uh, who was also very instrumental, is very different. This is Maya Lee. 
Marioli, I met her in Colombia for this book. I spent a week with her in the suburbs. And she lives in an extremely violent suburb uh, out of Bogota. And her, what happened to her is that when she was 12 years old, her best friend was shot in front of her, gang violence. And she realized that no one was going to do anything about it. You know, there was not going to be an investigation. You know, the, uh, uh, th there wouldn't be nothing. It just died. That's it. You know, that's, that's how hopeless people were there. So what she did, Marioli, again, alone, she took out all her friends, all, you know, the kids from the neighborhood, brought them to like a, space, you know, a hall, it's like a hall on the ground where they used to play. And she said, you know, we have to take over. You know, we have to do something. And they started talking about, so she created that think tank of children. Uh, and they started talking about violence. Um, here she is with one of the kids of the neighborhood, and, and here she is when she started like, uh, doing her, her bigger action. So basically, these kids started talking, and they all realized that violence started at home. Everyone had violence in their homes. So they started you know, trying to work in their family and said, you know, talk to their fathers, talk to their mothers. Maybe we don't have to you know, shout at each other or kill each other, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and the idea developed so, so in such a major way that she managed to stop the, the, the gangs, the, the drug cartels, the, the, the military for an entire day, to stop fighting for an entire day so children can go and cast a vote. And the question was, um, the question was, what kind of country do you want to live in, right? Two and a half million children went there. Uh, now, the military is forbidden from recruiting uh, kids under 18 years old. She's created um, peace zones in the entire country. She's inspired other countries to do the same. So, you know, just leave it up for the children. Um, and uh, she's been, no when, by the time I met her, she had been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize seven times. So that's Marioli, an uh, ordinary person in the suburbs of Bogota, right? So. I, I can go on and on, I'm not. Uh, I'm just uh, telling you, like, you know, after meeting these people individually and seeing that raw force, I also understood something really important, which is, um, you know, for me, it all became a question of narrative, right? Because if you see human rights or women's rights, you know, you need a narrative to marry a nine-year-old or to practice female genital mutilation or, or to impose anything on anyone. And that narrative hasn't changed. This is why it's changing now, and we don't know what's going to happen out of it, right? But what I can say is that when it comes from people like Mayoli, like Fatima, there is so much emotional wisdom there, there's so much experience, that the qualities that we need to uh, not only change the, the world for women, but to change the world in general, which was, you know, at, at the beginning I had these mothers, you know, wondering where they're going to find hope. Well, I don't have a better answer than these people. So now in Time for Change, you know, I'm lucky that I can bring this idea to a very big campaign and global, but I do exactly the same thing. I'm still looking for the Mayoli and the Fatima of this world. And so um, I'll just show you a couple of examples. I, I have a paper which is, I know it's very forbidden in TED, but I do, uh, because I want to quote, I want to quote a couple of them. Uh, first of all, I, I mean, I forgot to quote Fatima, and I, want, I do want to uh, read just a little piece of her book, and she says, because it's really about that, I lit a flame, I put my precious burden on my shoulders, and I left. I couldn't walk in the dark any longer, I don't want to live in fear and intimidation. God gave me intelligence and faith. I am like a book. All women are like a book, which title is their husband's. Take the time to open the book. That's how she starts her book. And Mayoli says, um, children have a special way of convincing people of the organizing reality. When children speak of pain and sorrow, adults are touched and able to feel their own pain. That's why we are the seeds that can end the war. I mean, you understand that we are getting to a point where the children you know, are taking on the, you know, finishing, terminating a war that has been going on for 40 years. So I let you, like, you know, reflect upon this, but this is what's happening. And uh, all of this is thanks to this 12-year-old. Uh, I mean, she's not 12 anymore, but at, at the time uh, her best friend died, she was. So uh, now I'm trying to change, so I do exactly the same thing. I, I look for these people. And I would just like to feature like, a couple of stories because I wanted to show you something that uh, I think is really important, is the time that we live in now. Um, 
I think we could all agree that there's, more in, there's so much to be done, but there's more, more has been done in the last 20 or 30 years for women than in centuries and you know, generations combined, right? So here's the world we are in, and here's the world where you can, you know, there's a big gap in the two stories that I'm gonna show you, and th in this gap is where we matter, is where we can do something, right? I, look for these people and I let them, you know, I give them a global audience. Uh, everything matters, you know, the people that are being helped in, Ch in Chan are being helped from people all over the world, they're connecting together. And I think that this networking that's happening that we're not seeing is, is the, the force that, that might shift the balance. Not only the balance of gender, also the balance of terror, and also the balance of, you know, all the ills that you hear everybody uh, every day on the, in the news. So. This little girl here, uh, her name is Ravina. Uh, here's what she says, okay? She says, I don't know who I am. I don't know how I feel. I don't know where I was born. I don't know who I am getting married to. This is, this is my wedding picture. I have never met him before. In a tradition, the girl doesn't see the groom. Her wishes are unimportant as long as parents agree. She just gets sent off with some money and closing. So Ravina, uh, we don't know how old she is, but she's probably around 12 years old. Uh, seven million, seven, 700 million girls will be married before the age of 18 this year, right? She's one of them. But then, in the same generation, and in the same time, we have someone you all know, because she became a voice. Um, sorry, that's not her, Malala. And Malala, you know, was very much a little Ravina. She's a little girl from Pakistan, right? All of a sudden, we gave her a Nobel Peace Prize. You know, she's become rec recognized. But you are, I don't know if you can hear all the voices that are not heard, you know, be, be beneath hers or, you know, behind hers. And what's, that's what... So this picture of Malala was taken um, two years before she was shot. So this, this, what I'm going to quote from her now, comes before anything happened to her through the Taliban. She says, I'm inspired by my father. I hope in the future I myself can become a good influence and inspiration for people. Before the Taliban came, I wanted to become a doctor to save lives. But after living through this, I realized that the country needs great politicians. So my dreams have changed. And, uh, and you know the rest of the story. So this is it. This is what I wanted to tell you. You know, I can only hint at the potential of all these women and why I'm, you know, not only I'm focusing on her, on them, but I'm also saying, you know, you are the victims yet. You probably are the one, the one who's going to get us out of this mess. Thank you very much.